This video on the 2010 Wii game Kirby's Epic Yarn will feature scenes and spoilers from the entirety of the game. I would highly recommend you play the game for yourself first, and then watch this video afterwards. Now that that's out of our way, let's cue that classic Drew Doodle intro. Yeah, that's the one. Very nice. When I was a kid back in 2010, I had a subscription to National Geographic Kids. While looking through it, there were obviously a lot of advertisements because print is a dying medium. Coincidentally, this was my first exposure to Kirby because I would see an advertisement for the new game Kirby's Epic Yarn. My local library had a copy, which I borrowed and played for a bit. But it failed to catch my interest because I thought it was too... I guess back then I would have said it was too girly. Because as we all know, being feminine is the worst, right? Well, oh boy, did Drew have a lot of things to learn about himself. But anyways, it would be a long time before I would pick the game up again. And by that point, I had some more experience with the Kirby franchise, specifically Return to Dreamland and 64. Since I was older, I was in a less judgmental headspace and I was able to interpret the game in a far less negatively biased way. I've been trying to work up the motivation to do sort of a Kirby series retrospective where I would do a few long form reviews on a selection of main series games to see how the series has changed over time. I haven't quite felt like my channel is large enough to do something like that and have it be worth it yet especially considering I make all these videos in my limited college free time. But for the longest while, I've had this itch to do something Kirby related, so I figured I'd test the waters by writing about a game that has very little to do with the main series. So let's go for it. Uh, let me know if you want to see more, but for now, it's time for me to do a Kirby's Epic Yarn long form review. Let's start with this mind-blowing art direction, because it's the game's entire selling point. Everything in the game is themed around yarn and fabric, a very arts and crafts type aesthetic. All the characters are nothing more than strands, and this is used to great effect in the character animation, as everything has very fluid motion, especially Kirby. We'll get to his controls in a bit, but the way he morphs between all of his forms is so charming. All the backgrounds and platforms look just as soft and fluffy, and they use subtle touches to emphasize any given object's state. For example, if you can stand on top of something, it often has stitching in it. A lack of stitching then means that there's a hidden secret. Sometimes to represent a wind current, they'll have the fabric ruffle, which is another cute touch. And you can also jump into doors to get behind the backgrounds, making the game's worlds feel like a truly flat quilting project. And you can see Kirby's round little bump from behind the fabric, it's just so cute. I also love how stuff like dirt and clouds are represented by cotton. Needless to say, this is an incredibly appealing art style that has a lot of detail put into it to provide visual clarity. But the even more incredible thing is, the team over at Goodfield didn't stop there. They also used this art style to create a level of tactility with the world, one that most games don't even take advantage of. There are buttons you can swing on, zippers you can pull to make the environment unfold, and strings you can yank to reposition platforms temporarily or permanently. There are tags you can use to remove patches that have lots of secrets behind them. My favorite ones are the surprise tags that you have to follow to something that looks like scenery, but it actually has a collectible behind it. I haven't even mentioned the different yarn blocks yet. Basically, if it's just a square, you can unravel it, but if it's filled in, you need another way to unravel it. There are blocks that have down arrows. If you give it some air time, it'll fall down. All of this is to say, the yarn look isn't just a look, although it is totally gorgeous. It also provides a lot of creative gameplay that gets consistently well utilized. I mean, I didn't even mention any level specific gimmicks yet. This is just the stuff that can be found in most areas of the game. Epic Yarn has some of the cutest and most entertaining art direction I've ever beheld, and the game is worth playing for it alone, frankly. So is there any point to this review even continuing? Uh, yeah, obviously. I have other thoughts on other parts of the game, too. She's impatient. Exploring these levels is also a lot of fun because Kirby himself has a really reliable moveset. His normal walk may be way too slow, but that's no problem when he can just turn into a car and gain some acceptable speed. He can also turn into a parachute for a basic slow descent, an anvil for a basic ground pound style attack, and turn into a submarine 
and go for a slow, awkward swim. And let me be clear right now, I freaking hate this thing. For the most part, this is an overall pretty basic move set, but the transformation makes it a lot more visually stimulating. Kirby may be missing his inhale and copy abilities for this adventure, but he's been given a new move that fits in a lot better with the world his Yarn Whip. If you want a comparison to a similar mechanic, I'd say the Yarn Whip is not unlike Cappy from Mario Odyssey. If you're not sure how to interact with something 99 times out of 100, it's by tossing your hat. Likewise, you do literally almost everything with the Yarn Whip. You can use it to grab stuff and pull it apart, including enemies, but you can also hold onto the Whip button to turn enemies into your personal ammunition. I think it's a very simple and intuitive way of making the world that much more uh, touchable, yeah. And as a centerpiece to Kirby's moveset, it's a brilliant inclusion. These aren't the only things we have to talk about with regards to the controls though, because this game likes to make liberal use of gimmicky transformation sections, and despite how negative I just sounded, this batch is not all bad. Sure, most of them are pretty underwhelming. So the first one we have here is the tank. Uh, you roll forward and destroy everything in your path using some missiles, tilting the Wiimote to aim. This one's pretty mindless, and it's obviously just meant to be the big set piece, so I'm very indifferent to it. By the end, it was beginning to wear out its welcome. The UFO and Mole, uh, they managed to wear out their welcomes almost immediately due to some pretty poor controls. Using the UFO to suck up enemies is charming, and it's really fun to zap everything off the screen. Yeah, sure, okay but the thing throws its weight around way too much. Bounces like crazy if you bump into a wall, making its auto-scrolling stage a nightmare to gold rank, and it moves too slowly to get away from all the flying baddies. The mole's movement is also super slow, and it's unclear when you're going to stick to a wall or, or fall down it. Like, I, I could not for the life of me get the hang of how to effectively pilot around in the dirt. Really hated these two. But the worst of all the transformations is the train. I may hate how this thing looks more than the submarine. Like, I don't know what it is about Kirby's face being shoved onto a vehicle, but I, I just get so upset looking at it. Even worse are the controls for this thing. You have to point at the screen to draw the tracks. This, as you can probably imagine, makes the tracks super jittery, leading to weird moments where the train can climb up walls and crawl on ceilings absolute nightmare material. It's just very sloppy, it's not very intuitive or fun to use, and the train's slow speed means that these sections just never end, especially when you're going for 100%. The swimming sections are also pretty awful. The submarine is, say it with me, painfully slow. That's what they are. The dolphin transformation speeds things up and makes moving around underwater a lot more tolerable, but moving 360 degrees with a D-pad feels weird. It's definitely no Rayman Legends, that's for sure. But to end on a more positive note, the last three transformations were actually really fun and I got excited every time I had to use them. The Penguin is an auto runner where you're constantly speeding forward and trying to figure out which path ahead is the optimal one. The Roadster similarly involves high speed platforming, although you do have a bit more control over your speed. These sections are framed as races and that makes them all the more engaging to me as you figure out how to pass up your opponents. And the rocket is an on-rails shooter. I would also say gameplay-wise I'm pretty indifferent, but these sections didn't wear out their welcome, mainly because shooting a bunch of stuff and seeing beads fly everywhere is endlessly entertaining to me. Not to mention the Roadster and the Rocket have some of the best tracks in the game. But, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. We need to talk about the level design first. The level design in this game is unremarkable from a layout standpoint. You walk towards the end of the level, and you dodge fairly simple obstacles. As someone who generally prefers more fast-paced and reflex-intensive platformers, the linear paths through each of these stages threaten to make me feel quite critical of the game. But the linear path isn't what makes the levels fulfilling. This game likes to emphasize stopping and smelling the roses. There are a lot of little secrets and collectibles that'll pop up the more you slow down and take your time interacting with things. You might find beads or find a hidden room with a special challenge the more you use your moves to look around. The game might move at a very relaxed pace, sometimes annoyingly so, 
but it has more than enough little moments in each level that keep grabbing your attention. A lot of this does have to do with the art style continually giving you great visuals and level gimmicks, but the exploration for secrets is just as rewarding. That's not to say the platforming is incompetent, it's perfectly functional, it's just that that's about all it is. It's really up to the visuals, interactivity with the world, and many objectives to pull their weight and keep the player going. If you just beat each level by rushing to the end, you're not gonna have a good time at all. This game doesn't demand a lot of platforming prowess, and even if you mess up on a jump, you, you can't even die. So you're really gonna have to focus on each level's smaller objectives to get the most enjoyment out of them. And that makes this game surprisingly difficult. In each level, you have several side questy things to try and tackle. You need to explore and find three treasures in each level. These give you one music track, which is great, and two pieces of furniture, which is used for the apartment stuff. In both cases, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, so let's just put a pin in both of those for now. You can search for three patches for the roulette wheel, which gives you a ton of potential beads in case your rank is a bit behind. Ooh, and, and speaking of, you need enough beads to fill up the bracelet at the top of the screen to get a gold rank. The beads thing is pretty doable in most levels, since beads are literally everywhere. Enemies drop them, they're inside stuff, sometimes they make pretty pictures, so you're not gonna have a hard time filling up the bracelet. You might have a hard time keeping it full though. See, you, you can't die, right? But you can drop handfuls of beads. If you get hit or fall in a hole, you'll lose some of them. It's not so bad if you get hit since you can pick most of them right back up, but if you fall down a pit, they are gone. And that sucks. This is the true challenge of Kirby's Epic Yarn, and it can be surprisingly frustrating at times in levels with tons of falls or tons of enemies. Future City, Dark Manor, and Deep Dive Deep being the poster child for this disease. Heck, I'd even say Spaceland as a whole is the most content to just slap you in the face over and over again, and I got really exhausted playing it. I can say the same about the bosses. They can't kill you, obviously, so the whole point is to farm them for beads and then take them out, which is usually painfully easy. Fangora, Hot Wings, Squashini, and Kapamari are total pushovers, and if it wasn't for racking up beads to get the extra level patches, they would be done in two seconds. DDD and Meta Knight are actually kind of hard to pull off well, and actually effectively get up in your grill with their attacks, making them the best bosses in the game. Yin Yarn seemed impossible to get a good rank in, as evidenced by my 10 naive restarts in my most recent playthrough, but then it turned out the tank section at the end literally fills you up all the way, so you don't even have to try that hard. Overall, bead collecting is the most challenging part of the game, even if sometimes it goes a bit overboard, and sometimes it goes completely underboard, but usually they strike that balance in between. None of the treasures are all that frustrating, and you're gonna be poking around every corner of every stage looking for beads anyway, so you're bound to stumble onto most of them, even when playing casually. The only times I got frustrated trying to get them is when I missed a jump in an auto running section, and even then I was just like, ooh darn, oopsie mostly because I knew I got an underwhelming optional reward if I missed them anyway, so they're fine. They do their job. But like I said, the ultimate rewards for getting them are the weakest part of this game by far. You can use them to decorate the Quilty Court apartment building. This is annoying in the first place because you have to pay out of pocket to unlock most of the apartments, and then you get to decorate them. But it's not like I was doing a lot with the beads anyway, I just hate spending money. Anyways, there's six apartments total. Kirby's pad is just a blank canvas. You can put any furniture and any wallpaper you want and take a photo, but it's by no means required. And the rest of the apartments matching the furniture with their silhouettes will attract new tenants, and each of them let you play extra mini games. Zeke makes you play hide and seek with tiny versions of himself, Beedrix makes you collect X number of beads and a time limit, Carrie makes you do an annoying escort mission, also in a time limit, and Buster makes you defeat a number of enemies, uh, unsurprisingly, within a time limit, and Mara makes you race her to the goal, which is actually pretty fun because you get to actually do stuff at a quick pace for once in the game. The rest of them are not that fun, and it sucks they're required for 100% because all they give you is fabric. That's the biggest issue with these collectibles, they're ultimately meaningless. 
I know that's a complaint you can make in a lot of games, but it's made worse here because of the quilty court shops. They have even more fabric and furniture to buy, which sucks up your beads even more after you spent them unlocking stupid little distractions. Which, okay, first of all, Dom Wool, why does Kirby even have to pay for your business venture? Just say, oh, uh, we're doing awesome, we can expand. All these bead sinks are ultimately for Kirby's apartment, which, like I said, is just there to be a glorified photo booth. Stuff like this is why I barely ever go out of my way to 100% games. It's rarely ever worth it. At least the furniture is nice to look at, and there's a great variety and appearance between them all. Since they have to match the levels they're a part of thematically, they really emphasize how much variety Kirby's Epic Yarn has in each of its stages. So many level cliches get used, but in such a rapid-fire manner that you're always seeing something relatively new, and even though they're cliches, that's not a complaint. Every world has a different theme that the individual levels take the very basic concept of and then run wild with. Grassland is a pretty self-explanatory theme, but you visit a waterfall, a beanstalk that goes up into the clouds, a mold den, and even a spooky forest. Hotland has the whole heat spectrum packed into a few stages, from desert and lava themed stages to nighttime dunes and the self-proclaimed cool cave. Treatland has food, toy, and music themed levels. Some of my favorite platformer cliches of all time cannot get enough of those. And here I get to experience them all back to back to back. Waterland is kind of the worst world overall because it uses the submarine. But the beach level that goes from night to daytime is cute and the pirate level ship is fine, if a little bit frustrating. But Snowland is really the best in terms of level theming because you have a jolly Christmas town, a cozy set of mitten cabins, and a calm, quiet ice level. It's absolutely adorable. Spaceland has a fun aesthetic, but like I said before, the high difficulty made me really tired of it. Dreamland is a great conclusion because it's just an entire world of Kirby fan service. From green greens to butter building to the freaking halberd, this is just a joy to play through as a Kirby fan. If I had to pick favorites, I would say Hotland and Snowland in a heartbeat. They make the most out of their basic themes, as do all the worlds, but I feel like these two in particular go the extra mile. That deserves some recognition. Hotland is the most versatile visually, and I love it for that, but Snowland is the most pleasant, feel-good world. It puts the biggest smile on my face as I play through it. That being said, Kirby's Epic Yarn consistently puts a rather large grin on my face due to its overwhelming pleasantness. All of the other games I've done videos on have had some sort of edge to them, be it Splatoon's skate culture influence, Crash Bandicoot's irreverent humor, or Pikmin's constant reminders of the inevitability of death. Heck, even most Kirby games have some sort of heavy, darker themes towards their ending stretches, but Epic Yarn avoids all of that and is just content to make the player feel fuzzy. This is done very intentionally with the art style, you know, since Yarn does tend to literally be very fuzzy and soft, and playing the game feels that way, but it's also done in all areas of the presentation. Like, the cutscenes are presented in a kind of finger puppet theater type style with a bedtime story delivery. The narrator even does silly voices for each of the different characters. It feels weirdly nostalgic to me. You can't be mean to my Waddle Dees. Only I can be mean to my Waddle Dees. That was when Yin Yarn's troops decided to show King DDD who was boss. Hey, that tickles. Okay, that hurts. Yeah, uncle. And in no time, they had King DDD wrapped up like a birthday present. <laughs> Only one more step and Dreamland will be mine. What an honor to have a king serving me. I will take a chunky aside to say that the game's overall narrative is serviceable. I don't think it really does much to enhance the game, although the contrast between the papery real world and the yarn it gets turned into is a neat visual idea. All it really does is provide an excuse for Kirby to be turned into yarn, and everything after that is just done to fabricate a conflict. I, yes, I did intend that pun. Kirby and Fluff's relationship doesn't really feel real outside of the fact that they are working together, so them saying goodbye has absolutely no weight to me, but it's still cute watching Kirby do things. 
DDD and Meta Knight are also really only here because they're the most recognizable Kirby characters and had to be included to make this coat of paint on an original idea feel worth it. It's pretty well known that in the early stages of development, this game starred Prince Fluff. The game was even called Fluff of Yarn. The game was likely made into a Kirby game for brand appeal, but I think ultimately that was a mistake. If this had been an original Good Feel IP, they could have expanded on the ideas in this game with a sequel. Imagine if this had taken off, and instead of Yoshi's Woolly World and Crafted World, we explored this ideas with an original cast of characters. That would have been pretty great, and while I'm really not complaining about the timeline of games we ended up on, I do like when Nintendo publishes new IPs from their studios. Moving on. Another element of the visual presentation I really like is the level unlocks. After each stage, you get a patch, and after you toss it, a short cutscene plays where some new object or character briefly appears to open the way to the next level. All of these are super charming but I took the time during my playthrough and my extensive note taking to play favorites, which you've been watching during this section. It really just goes to highlight how creative the team over at Good Feel really is. The relaxed feel of this game is especially made clear in the soundtrack by Tomoya Tomita after his work on not only this game, but also Wario Land Shake It and Yoshi's Woolly World, he's quickly become one of my favorite composers. On the surface, it's a very simple soundtrack that prioritizes minimalism over anything else, having the piano at its center and supplementing it with various other instruments. You could probably already guess that from the transformation themes I played earlier, but the regular stages also really go ham with this idea as well, like in Weird Woods. Cool cave. Melody Town. And Frosty Wheel. Some tracks really go wild with more out there sounds, which feel a little out of place with the rest of the score, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't love them. My infatuation with loud, bizarre synths forbids any hatred towards them anyway. I appreciate Spaceland's funky drums. <laughs> and the showdowns with several of the bosses like Fangora, final boss fight with Yin Yarn. Those last two tracks also showcase the great arrangements of past Kirby tunes, of which there are many in the final world. I know this section's been going on for way too long, but I can't help myself. And also stuff like this is why I provide the timestamps for sections. But for the sake of pretending to care about brevity, I really like this game's takes on Green Greens and Ice Cream Island the best.
thank you for sitting through my Kirby's Epic Yarn mixtape. I just really wanted to do a deep dive deep into how this game creates such an unstressful playing experience through its ancillary building blocks. Thing is, these things are so overbearingly nonchalant that they would threaten to make the game very mindless. But because the game is supplemented by the challenges I mentioned before, namely exploring for treasures and trying to hold on to beads, it keeps the game engaging and enjoyable. Kirby's Epic Yarn is one of the most flat-out, lovable games I have ever played. It embraces a fun art style that isn't just an art style, it's actually part of the game. I can't believe how rare that is for a game to do. It has a great soundtrack and a chill vibe all around, not to mention the incredible gameplay that uses the tactile nature of the world to its advantage to keep you invested. Add on a bunch of cute themes and little moments within each level, and you have a recipe for a successful game. Is it true that the level design's kinda meh? Yeah. Does it have its frustrating sections? Oh yes. Does it have useless collectibles that pad out the game time if you go for 100%? Oh absolutely. Does it shove in Kirby when it could have been a brand new universe for Nintendo fans to fall in love with? I mean, the Kirby fan service is phenomenal, but I would have loved an original game. Even so, that's more of a subjective factor surrounding the circumstances of this game's development rather than a subjective flaw with the game itself. Even despite all of these problems, this is a quality game that's almost impossible to not at least like. It's very laid back and chill, but it still finds ways to keep your brain active, and that's quite the accomplishment. Kirby's Epic Yarn is a thoroughly enjoyable experience from beginning to end, and you should definitely take the time to let it make you smile.